phenomenon art, but in a way it goes back uh, almost 30 years ago to a paper of, to a result attributed to Schwartz in a paper by Hefliger and Salen. And let me give you a Torish version of the theorem. Uh, take a torus and take a manifold and take a torus action on the manifold and assume that the manifold is connected. Now, suppose that you have a diffeomorphism of the manifold and suppose that it takes every point to a point on the same orbit. So for every point, you will have an element of the torus that you act with that element to, to reach um, psi of that point, where psi is the diffeomorphism. And if the diffeomorphism is equivariant, then on each orbit, you just have a shift. So you can actually have an invariant. For each orbit, you will have a, one element of the torus and you're shifting by that element. But you'd like to, the, the challenge is, is to make that function smooth. Can you find a smooth function with values in the torus that does this, that takes each, such that the diffeomorphism takes, uh, uh, act, um, is given by the action by the torus element associated to the point. Um, because the action is faithful, uh, it, it is free on an open dense set. So eta on the open dense set is not ambiguous. So the only question is, does it extend smoothly? To the rest um, of the manifold beyond the um, open dense set where the action is free. And here is a paper of Hafliger and Salem, the first page of the paper. And you can see at the very big bottom, well, they have, they do a really nice thing there. They take actions of Torah and orbifolds. And I'm going to try to avoid saying anything about orbifolds in my talk. Uh, but they take little pieces of torus action on orbifold, um, little tubular neighborhoods of orbits, and they ask, can we glue them together? And in how many ways can we glue them together? And they do a beautiful job, except there's a technical piece that they rely on, which is crucial, crucial, crucial for their results, which is more analytic. And this is explained at the very, very bottom of this page that I put up. Um, they use a basic result, and they say, this is a basic, we don't use a basic result whose proof was given to us by Gerald Schwartz, see section three. And that basic result is the one I want to talk about today. Um, and maybe I will also get, there's going to be, um, actually, no, I will, okay, I'll, I'll leave the slide up and we'll tell your story. So, I've known about this paper since I was a postdoc at MIT and Sue Tillman and Eugene Lerman were working on their paper on symplectic toric orbifolds. So they were explaining to me this Hefliger Salem paper that helped them with their strategy of, of their paper. Um, and I knew about that theorem of tori actions, tori actions, which I really like. It's really beautiful. But I never quite read the proof. I never studied the proof. If you look at uh, Hefliger Salem's paper, there's that crucial lemma of Schwartz, and there's a proof there, and then like at some crucial points, they, they give you these technical stuff, they go back to some paper of Schwartz, earlier paper of Schwartz, 100 pages, and they sort of point at what there should do the job. So it's not self-contained, and I found it hard to read. Um, and I was thinking maybe one day I'll ask the student to read it and explain it to me. That's what you do when you don't understand something. And um, okay. Uh, maybe I'll tell you another story. Sorry, this is a, a lot of stories here. I, I was a PhD student, uh, well, I guess. I am, I, I am a, a, a graduated PhD student of Shlomo Sternberg. And Shlomo Sternberg once told me that he never used a theorem that he cannot prove. But, well, that's not everyone is Shlomo Sternberg. So back in 2013, I went to a conference in Etaha and I met Andre Hefliger and I was very excited to meet him. And I told him, you know, I, there's this theorem in your paper with Salem, which I really, really like, which you attribute to Gerald Schwartz. But, you know, maybe you can tell me a little bit more about that. It's, there's something technical there. I never quite, quite really checked. I've used it, but I've never quite checked the proof, never quite understood the proof. And he looks at me and says, well, I haven't quite understood it either. So that was very reassuring. 
Uh, not everyone is Shlomo Sternberg. And then two years ago, um, I went to another conference in, near Bonn and I met Gerald Schwartz and I told him, oh, actually, before I get to tell this part of the story, let's do a little bit of math. So I'm going to talk about the generalization of that theorem. Instead of Torah, I, I will look at the compact Lie groups of type HS. HS stands for Hefliger Salem. Um, this is a uh, name that Gerald Hart, that, that, Ger that um, um, Gerald Schwartz, Schwartz suggested. And it really comes from this paper of Hefliger Salem. If, if you have an orbifold, local slices to the T orbits are given by linear um, actions of uh, closed subgroups of the torus, but th this is an orbital setup. So the linear action is acting on a finite uh, linear quotient of, of your vector space. And if you, and again, I'm not going to tell you what orbitals are, but basically what you end up doing is you, look, you end up looking at the, the action locally when you linearize it, you get linear actions of a compact Lie group, um, which is an extension of the torus by finite group. And every such a group has the property that its identity component is contained in its center. And I put the proof down. I'm not going to read it out loud. I put the proof on the slide, but I will not read it out loud. And that property turns out to be a crucial property. We call these, these are groups that Gerald Schwartz calls uh, of type HS. And actually, I suspect that type HS implies that um, you are an extension of a torus by finite group. Um, but um, I don't know this for sure. Definitely the examples we know have this property. So a group of types as HS is a compact Lie group whose identity component is contained in its center. And here is a version of a theorem for groups of type HS, very similar before to before. You have a connected manifold, faithful action of a Lie group of type HS. You have an equivariant diffeomorphism which takes each orbit to itself. That these are the assumptions. The conclusion is that there exists a smooth map, um, which is um, such that uh, the diffeomorphism is, is, is given by each point. You take C, which group element the map takes it, and you act by that group element. And if you sort of look at it very closely in this non-abelian version, the condition on the smooth map from the manifold to the group should be that it is not invariant, but rather equivariant with respect to the conjugation action on the target. So this is like the main theorem I'm going to be talking about. There's going to be another version soon, which is a little bit more technical. But there's also a message here. The message is that there's some nice things happening with groups of such HS, and they might be worth studying. And here, oh, let me tell you, sorry, let me tell you the next story. So two, two years ago, I met Gerald Schweitz and I told him, you know, there's this theorem of yours in this paper by Hefliger Sale and, and, you know, maybe you can tell me a little bit about it. The proof is, uses this long paper of yours. And as soon as I say that, that's the first time I met him. I never met him before. As soon as I say that, his face starts going down and he starts mumbling. And I was trying to figure out what he's saying. And he's like, well, I don't know. Like, he was mumbling something which I couldn't quite understand. So that, we had a whole week in that conference and we talked. And it turns out that in this paper of Hefflinger Salem, the lemma that they attribute to Schwartz is, is actually wrong. Um, they sort of talked with Schwartz and they told him how to do it. But apparently there was some misunderstanding because you know, once the paper was out, he knew right away something, something in the channel of communication didn't go right. So um, what is happening in this lemma, which is, so, so this lemma is, is, this is lemma 3.2 in their paper. This is a linear version of the theorem I wrote before. So this is a version where the action is linear, the group action, well, the group action is linear. The diffeomorphism here is, um, is it just a diffeomorphism. Um, and in this lemma, they're not assuming that the diffeomorphism is equivariant. And without that assumption, there's a counterexample. For example, circle action, standard circle action on the complex plane, complex conjugation takes each over to itself, but it's not given by any smooth um, map to the circle. So the lemma was wrong. And then Jerry Schwartz and I sort of just, I, you know, 
talked about it. And well, yes, the covariant version is right. So let's sort of fix everything and and see what's missing. And um, so until yesterday, we thought we fixed our paper. <laughs> but as of, as of now, we did fix the paper. That's that's the, the um, but there was a, a, a little piece that we only um, realized in the last 24 hours. We, as of yesterday, we had a really nice theorem that doesn't quite, the theorem I wrote before we had, we had a while ago, um, but the fix of the paper requires a tiny bit more. So we can fix the paper. So how is it wrong? The diffeomorphism at the very, very first stage, they pay they compose it with a linear map in order to achieve, uh, this is the prism of a vector space, they want, which takes the origin to itself. They want to assume that the differential um, at the origin is, is the identity map. And in order to be able to assume that, you need a version of, of the theorem where everything is linear, not just the action, but also the, the diffeomorphism. So I wrote here this on the version, and that's the one which is actually false if you do not assume the covariant. And um, that's, that's the sort of the glitch, that's a glitch in their paper. What, and you know, what, once you fix it, I'm gonna explain how to fix it and how to get the theorem. Uh, just in the last 24 hours, and I, uh, 24 hours, Jerry and I realized that our beautiful theorem doesn't quite fix Hefliger's sale on his paper because their um, diffeomorphism is, is not a quadrant, but it is a quadrant with respect to an automorphism of the group that is trivial at the identity component. And that's good enough. So everything we do just works under these assumptions, but then we, I had to change my slides to adjust for that. And this is a somewhat more technical assumption, but all the methods are still fine. So we do fix their, we do fix their paper. Um, so let me now, remind you of the less um, technical version of the theorem, printing it up there. And um, let me give you the outline. We prove a version, first of all, we do a lot of stuff when the group is a billion. We prove a version when everything is linear, the, diff the, diff the, 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 the group action is linear on a vector space, the diffeomorphism is linear. That, that's the piece that was missing from, from their paper, just a little glitch. And then we pretty much follow their footsteps except we give a new proof, we give a self-contained proof that does not have to rely this, on this sort of much bigger theory. Everything is, very, is completely self-contained. So we prove an infinitesimal version of their um, theorem, which is for um, uh, vector um, fields rather than different physics. And then we sort of use a deformation argument to give a theorem for when the linear action, but the different prism is not linear. And then we upgrade that to vector bundles. We use the slice theorem to get the theorem for general groups with abelian group actions. And then you need to upgrade to the non-abelian case. So you need the theorem for finite group combined with the first theorem for abelian group and cook up a proof for the general case. So let's talk a little bit about these Lie groups that, that I'm talking about. Um, the condition by definition, type HS means the um, identity component is contained in the center. In particular, the identity component is a torus. And uh, that is equivalent to requiring the quotient of the group by its center to be finite. So we have two extreme examples. One of them is when the group is finite, and the other one was the group is a torus or more generally compact abelian. And you can take their products, but there's also examples which are not products. And the crucial, crucial property of, well, okay. Here's one thing which is common to, to tori and to finite groups. If you have a tor finite group acting on a connected manifold and if it acts faithfully, then the action is free on an open band set. And if a torus acts on a manifold, faithfully and the manifold is connected, then again, the action is free and an open dense set. And if a compact abelian group, doesn't have to be a torus, compact abelian group acts, well, once again, the action is free and an open dense set, except for the compact abelian group, you can weaken the assumption 
it's enough to assume that the quotient of the, of the manifold is connected. You don't need the manifold itself to be connected. For the finite group, it's not enough to assume that the quotient is connected. The manifold itself needs to be connected. So we have here a version which combines the two. It turns out that the relevant condition, in order to conclude that the action is trained on open and set, the relevant assumption is that the quotient by the center be connected. So here we go. That's what makes compactly group of type HS work for us. If that you have a faithful action on a manifold, if the quotient by, um, by the center is connected, then there's an open dense set where the action is, uh, is free. Uh, do I have Question, maybe this is a good time to stop for questions. Are there any questions? Okay. So I, I, I will not, again, I'm including some proofs in the slides that I will not, um, will not read out loud. So this is, not, this is nothing about the different system. That's just about the action. This is just about the action. Um, now we go back to the diffeomorphisms. Um, there's even one more step where you can do something more general, not needed for Hefliger Salem, but we might as well do it. Um, I would like to look at orbit preserving equivariant uh, smooth maps. And I am, in fact, allowing for Hefliger and Salem, I am allowing the map to be uh, equivariant. Uh, with respect to an automorphism of the group uh, that uh, fixes um, the identity component. Well, it turns out that every orbit preserving equivariant smooth map, a priori, you just need to assume it's a smooth map, you can conclude that it is an invertible, it is a diffeomorphism. So in this theorem I told you about, you don't need to assume that size of diffeomorphism. It's enough to assume that it's a smooth map. So that's in blue, slight strengthening of what we had before. And the other part in blue here is again, slight strengthening of what we had before. So I'm repeating the same theorem, a little bit more technical, but um, more general. Orbit preserving, smooth map, equivariant with respect to an automorphism that is trivial on and here I had needed to be trivial on an abelian group, which uh, lies between the identity component and the center. <coughs> and the quotient of the manifold by that abelian group needs to be connected. Then you can find an equivalent smooth map to the group by which you act. A little bit more technical, but basically that's what we Yael, you have a question from Don Stanley. Oh. Yes. Are, some, are such groups extensions of a maximal torus by a finite group? So this is, I, I mentioned that earlier in the talk. So uh, the ones that we actually care about, <coughs> they are ex finite extensions <coughs> uh, of a torus. Now the torus is a quotient of the group, not a subgroup. It's not a sub-torus, it, it's a quotient of the group. But the ones that we care about are finite extensions of the torus. And all the examples that we know are finite ex extensions of a torus. And I suspect that, that type AHS is equivalent. I suspect it will be equivalent to a finite extension of the torus. The, the challenge is, is to find a, um, but, I don't, but I don't know this for sure. I don't have a proof. I suspect it's true, but that I do not, do not know. Thanks. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Don. Sorry, I'm, I have two screens here. One of them was not showing the comment. So let's move on. So let me look at the good news. One good piece of good news is that many of us are like toric actions, in particular locally, toric, tor, locally standard actions. And for these actions, you don't need everything that I'm talking about. For these actions, I can give you a one-page proof of the theorem. And my, I, I work with a definition of locally standard, which is slightly more general than what most of you might work with, because I'm adding in some extra parameters that I don't really care about. That's not. Sorry, that's not a big difference. So suppose you have just a torus acting on Cn cross R to the L by rotating of each of the N coordinates and ignoring the L coordinates. 
ignoring the L, uh, the L rail coordinate. And um, suppose that we have an orbit preserving epivariant dimorphism of this guy. And I will prove that it comes from a map to the source. So if it's orbit preserving, it's the, 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 T, the, the, the last real coordinates are not touched. These are the T's coordinates are not touched. Um, it means that if, if you take psi i to be the i complex coordinate of this guy, uh, it will be uh, invariant under the uh, jth torus for, for the jth circle for every circle for every j different from i, and it will be equivariant with respect to the i circle. So these are the properties of the individual coordinates coming from the equivariance of the original psi. So now we can restrict to Rn cross Rl. That's when the, all the coordinates are real. And this equivariance becomes a condition of symmetry or anti-symmetry. So, so if you take the i, so this is a complex valued function on n plus L real variables. But the target space being complex, you don't really care. For what I'm saying now, target space could be anything. You have a function which is, anti-symmetric in the variable xi and symmetric in the variable xj for all j different from i. And this is exact, and this function is smooth. And this is exactly the situation that Whitney studied back in 1943. Whitney tells us that you can find smooth functions gi so that your function psi i can be expressed as gi of x1 squared, x2 squared, squared etc. for all the j's for which it's symmetric. And the guy for which it's anti-symmetric, xi, we, can, we get to multiply that on the outside. And as soon as you have Whitney's form for, this, for these components of psi, you can use the S1 equivariance or the, the torus equivariance to upgrade this to a similar form for psi acting on, as a dysmorphism of, of, of all of Cn cross Rl. So we obtain that we can write psi in the form zi times gi, where gi is a smooth function of the norm squared of the complex coordinates and of the real coordinates. And at this point, we go back and remind ourselves that this was all orbit preserving. So the absolute value of psi i has to be the same as that of zi. So, so gi is in fact a map, not just to the complex numbers, but it is in fact a map to the torus to the circle. Each GI is a map to the circle. You put them together, you get a map to the torus, that does what we want. And in fact, if you read the advanced paper of his classification of symplectic torque manifolds, uh, you find this argument there. So let me go back to the theorem. And I, I now enumerated the different uh, items of the outline. And I'll actually go, the, the, go over them one by one. I'm going to go through each of them and give you a sketch of the proof of each step. So it's, it's kind of cute. I mean, many of them are already in the paper of I have to sell them, but really what we do is totally self-contained. And, and it's kind of, I, I, really, I like this theorem. It's a cute theorem. So let's start with the all linear version. <coughs> I'm, I'm focusing on the abelian case. The first five steps, I will focus on the abelian case. Um, so here, everything, everything, everything is linear. Uh, you have a linear action of an abelian group on a vector space. You have a linear isomorphism that preserves orbit. And the claim is that there exists a group element such that you act by that group element. Um, and the idea is the proof is the induction on the dimension. Um, if you, um, Take a trip. Well, if you take every re linear uh, representation, you can um, decompose into a direct sum of irreducible representations and trivial representations. If you have a trivial action, you just take the identity element of the group. If you have an irreducible abelian Lie group action, so necessarily, uh, if you have an irreducible action, then um, you would you just take any point in the, uh, in the uh, principal orbit type, it's, I'm sorry, any point in the principal orbit type straighten, um, see where it goes. It goes to some group element acting on that point. And then 
uh, using um, equivariance, that group element will be the guy that you act by throughout the principal um, orbit type. And um, the um, span of the principal orbit type straight term is everything. Now, for, now, of course, at this point, I'm not assuming that the action is faithful because I will be building my vector space from little representations which are irreducible, but where on each one separately, the action is not faithful. So there's some choice for this element, group element gamma. When you do the inductive step, you ex ex express your vector space as a sum of a direct sum of two vector spaces. You will have a group element for the first and a group element for the second, and you will want to find um, a group element that will work for the entire W. Um, so you're going to pick a guy in the principal orbital stratum of the first, a guy in the principal orbital stratum of the of the second. Um, take their sum, see what group element you acted on. Um, and there's a little, uh, and, and um, th then you have, and we call that gamma, but then you need to show that gamma is independent of the choice of X and Y. And to show that, you notice that um, if you take gamma, uh, the image of gamma, like modulo the kernel of the action on the first guy, that's constant by the inductive hypothesis. And the image of the gamma by the kernel of the action on the second guy, that's also constant um, by the inductive hypothesis. And you conclude that the uh, image of gamma under the kernel of the entire representation of W, which is the intersection of the two kernels, is, is in fact constant as well. So let me move to the next slide. Um, Actually, here I'm not giving the details. For the infinitesimal version, we have a self-contained um, proof, but I'm not giving you the details. I'll just give you a statement. Um, and if you want to do vector fields, uh, instead of, uh, in, instead of uh, deformorphisms preserving orbits, you're going to do vector fields tangents to orbits. But our group, its identity component is a torus. So for that, it's enough to look at it as a torus action. Um, and if you have a smooth family of vector fields uh, tangent to orbits, the theorem, which uh, I'm not showing here, the proof is that, in fact, you can find a smooth function to the Lie algebra of the forest such that the, the, the vector field is given by the infinitesimal action by those elements of the Lie algebra. And there's another piece here. Um, eventually, we will, this torus will be inside the center of a bigger group. Uh, so another piece which I did not put on the slide is, um, if your vector fields were in fact um, uh, invariant uh, or, what's, or, or uh, with respect to a bigger group action, um, then you can actually choose your alpha to be invariant with respect to the uh, uh, bigger group action, if, if the group action commuted with, with the torus action, which, which is the case for our case. And then there's a beautiful uh, Moser-type argument for upgrading the, inf the, the, the infinitesimal version of the theorem to the more sort of to the non to the case where the diffusion is nonlinear. So this is part three. So the action is still linear, but now we have an orbit-preserving diffeomorphism, not necessarily linear. And the first step is exactly the same as Hefliger-Salem, except we now have the proof of the all linear version in the abelian case. Um, and um, which is not that hard, but fine. Now it's made, now we have it. Uh, so you compose by a linear map in order to straighten out this situation to assume that the differential of the different prism is the identity at the origin. And then you linearize, you have a um, family of different prisms depending on a parameter between zero and one that gets us from the linear guy to our guy. And, the, and every element in this family is um, itself um, an equivariant diffeomorphism that takes each orbit to itself. So when you take the time derivative, you get vector fields, which are everywhere tangent to orbits. So you can realize them by the infinitesimal version of the theorem. You can realize them from a function to the Lie algebra. 
and then you integrate that function to, to get um, uh, Lie group elements, um, uh, to, to take a function to the Lie group, uh, in, this, in this case, a function to the torus. Um, that um, gives rise to our diffeomorphisms. So again, there's details I'm not showing here, but this is the main idea. Are there more questions? Okay. And then you want to upgrade to vector bundles. So you have a compact epithel on Lie group, and you have a closed subgroup acting linearly in the vector space, and you take the associated um, vector bundle. That's a bundle over A mod H. And you have an orbit preserving equivariant diffeomorphism. And we'd like to use this theorem for vector, for diffeomorphism as a vector spaces. So we need to straighten this out. We need to somehow change this so that um, each fiber of this vector bundle will be mapped to a fiber of the vector bundle. So that's what we do in step one. And once you do step one, once you've straightened it out, you can apply the previous part three of the proof um, to uh, obtain a function to the group that gives us the diffeomorphism. Uh, and finally, by Kozul slice theorem, whenever you have a convex group acting on a manifold, locally it looks like an associated bundle, so you can just apply the theorem for vector bundles. So at this point, I've proved the theorem when everything is abelian. So now we go into the non-abelian situation. So the extreme case is the case of a finite group. Um, I will assume that we have a finite group acting on a manifold, that the action is faithful, and um, that the quotient by this, of the manifold by the center of the group is connected. And under these assumptions, there is an um, yeah. Now, just to remind you, a finite group is always of type HS, always of type heterogeneous, because the identity component is, is is trivial. So that's in the center. So this is a situation where the group acts um, freely on an open dense set. So now assume that we have an orbit preserving um, smooth map. And if you want to smooth map, it doesn't really matter which one. Um, so that means that for each point, there exists a group element by which you act. Um, but now the group is finite. So the manifold decomposes into a finite union of closed sets, CK, labeled by the elements K of the finite group, where CK is the set of points by which the, which the diffeomorphism or the smooth map takes those points K by, act by, by the action of the element K. Um, by the big category theorem, we know that the interior, union of the interiors of these sets is dense. So you can just take the union of the closures. Because the union was finite, that's closed and dense, so that's all of them. So we know that each point to the manifold is in the closure of the interior of one of, of, of the CKs. But the union, of the disclosures of the interiors of the TKs, it, it, it will be disjoint. And the center, that K, preserves each of the CKs. And M modulo the center was connected, so there can be only one K. And that K gives us a group element by which um, our smooth map acts. So that's a proof for finite groups. And now let's do the general case. So this is the slide that I still fixed this morning. It's basically, it's almost identical to what we had, but this, this is what, I'm actually giving you here what we need, uh, not just for our theorem, but also to fix that figure statement. So what do we have here? We have a compact Lie group of type HS, which means the center that, that contains, the, the identity component is contained in the center. And if I really want the ultimate version of the theorem, I will have an abelian group anywhere between the identity component and the center. 
And for Hefliger Salem, we just need the manifold to be connected. Uh, but I, I'm okay with assuming that the quotient of the manifold by the group A is connected. That's enough. The group A is a billion. That's why I call it A. A stands for a billion. So we want to do it in two steps. We want to use that billion theorem, which I proved in steps one through five. And we want to use the theorem for finite groups, which I proved in step six. So let's start with the billion version. So I'm sorry, let, let me start by, by, by looking at the finite. So in order to, to apply the uh, finite group action, I, need to, I, I will need to mod out by, by A to, to reach the situation where I have a finite group. The finite group is going to be K modulo A. But here's a little bit of a glitch. K mod A does not act. It does act on the manifold modulo A, but the manifold modulo A is no longer a manifold. It has some singularities. But we can take the principal Oberstreit stratum in M, principal Oberstreit not for the group K, for the group A. Let me take the principal Oberstreit stratum for the group A. Uh, there, the action is free. So when you take the quotient, um, it's a manifold, so that's good. And why did I not want to take the principal Oberstreit for, for K? If I did, the quotient would still be a manifold, but I would not know if it is connected or not. But as soon as I take the principal orbit type stratum for A, that's a little bit bigger, and there I do know that its quotient is connected. Maybe not itself. The principal orbit type stratum itself might not be connected, but the quotient is. So you get some, it's a little bit subtle here. Um, but that's exactly what we need. So now uh, we have a manifold. M prime mod A is a manifold, it's smooth, and it's connected. So now we can. And that's the guy on which a finite group is acting. So we can apply the theorem for finite group. And that allows us to, that gives us a finite group element um, by which we act on the quotient. So you choose a representative. That, that, that element is in K mod A. You choose a representative in K. You um, compose our diffeomorphism by the inverse of that element. You get a new diffeomorphism. That new diffeomorphism might no longer be K equivariant, but that's okay. We, we no longer need that. We just need it to be A equivariant, and it is, because we multiply by some group element, and A is contained in the center. So this is exactly what we need. We have an A equivariant uh, diffeomorphism now, once we've made that correction, that adjustment. We have an A equivariant diffeomorphism of the original manifold, and the adjustment is such that you are now preserving A orbits. So you can apply the abelian theorem to get a function to the abelian group that gives you the diffeomorphism, and then you multiply by that element gamma in the, uh, to, to um, get a function that is good for your original psi. I'm not sure if I've lost anyone, but this is a good point for questions. After this, all that I have are some examples. Any questions so far? I think we're everyone, good. I think everyone, we're good. everyone's silent. Let me move on. Actually, I'm going to give you some non-examples. I'm going to exam give you examples where a lot of what things fail. So the first comment is this theorem. It's really a smooth theorem. It's not in the topological category. So for example, like if you have a, a, a group acting on, like let, let's say standard structure collection on the complex plane, okay? The formula I wrote here for Psi, it's an equivariant homeomorphism that takes each orbit to itself, but that does not come from a continuous map with values in the torus. So if you try to adapt that theorem to the topological category, it's, it's false. Um, the next example is that compactness is really, really crucial. For, for a while, I tried to play with groups whose identity component is contained um, in the center and um, and actually I, I actually tempt, was tempted to try identity component contained in the center and identity component acts uh, properly. I had, I had a different, completely different project where Jordan Watt wrote this was the right assumption. Somehow it doesn't work here. That doesn't work. You really need, you need compactness. So in, in this example I put on, on the slide that it's 
well, group is R, but that very same example also fails in, when you restrict to the Z action. So it's not enough to assume that the identity component acts properly. Um, so what is this example? You have a vector field which is a cleverly, just on the real line, cleverly chosen so that it has an isolated zero at the origin, but the vector field is flat as you approach the origin. And as a result of that, if you take the time one map of the flow of that vector field on the right-hand side and the time negative one on the left-hand side, they will fit together smoothly. So Psi will be smooth. But if you try to realize that smooth, and that is a smooth map that takes each uh, orbit to itself. The orbits are just uh, three orbits, the origin, the positive numbers, and the negative numbers. If you try to look for a map with values in the groups, in this case values in R, that gives rise to this psi, that map will have to take the value one for the positive numbers and negative one on that for negative numbers. So it's not, does not continuous, does not extend continuously. And faithfulness is also kind of crucial. Um, in the linear case, we do not need faithfulness. <coughs> in the nonlinear case, we do. Uh, here's an example which I wrote on the slide, circle action, that's kind of on the two torus. You're just rotating the first coordinate by twice as fast. So this, this action is not, is not faithful. And the diffeomorphism is, is sort of clever. You, you rotate the first coordinate, but the amount by which rotate is, depends on, is, is, just the sec, is given by the second coordinate. So if you want, no, of course, each point goes to a point in the same orbit, but you get to choose. So if you wanted a map that gives rise to this psi, it will have to take the pair of points BC to A square root of C. But we don't have a smooth or even continuous square root function from the circle to itself. And definitely, you cannot let go of the Heffsliger-Salem assumption, uh, at least a lot of counterexamples. Um, for example, here's a cute one. You take rotations of, of the two-sphere and take the antipode map. Now, suppose that this map really came from, from, from a function to, to SO3. Uh, that function takes each point to its, to its antipode. Um, so, uh, and, that's a, it, and that function is a rotation. So that element of, so if you fix a point, an element of SO3 taking the point to its antipode, um, in particular fixes the line through that point. So it, so your rotate, so your, um, um, so your, your, so you're preserving the orthogonal complement of that line. But the line was flipped. So on the orthogonal complement, you get a flip. But the orthogonal complement is just a tangent to the sphere at that point. So if we had a smooth eta of this form that does this job for the antipode, um, and, and at each point, you take the line um, which is fixed, the axis, which is fixed by that rotation, you will be getting a sort of uh, a, a one-dimensional foliation of, of the sphere, which we know does not exist by the, which, con which would contradict the Harry Ball theorem. And maybe the last um, non-example, maybe the last non-example uh, is that if we only assume that the identity component is a torus, but if we do not assume that it is contained in the center of the group, Here's a counterexample. We take the orthogonal group acting on R2 cross R, or on the R2, this is standard action. On R, this is just multiplied by plus or minus one, depending on the determinant. And the map taking U comma Xi, where U is an R2 and Xi is an R, taking it to U comma negative Xi, if you stare at it long enough, you'll see that map is a quivariant for the action of the orthogonal group it does take each orbit to itself. But again, it does not come from a smooth map with value. Oops, there's a typo in the slide. Okay, there's a typo in the slide. It does not come from a smooth map with values in O2. Um, and I will finish my talk here. So for the organizers, I will correct that typo as well as any other typos I might find later. And I will send you a revised version of this slide. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Karshan. Could we all uh, unmute now and show our appreciation for such a fine talk?